I see that. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. So welcome everyone um, to the uh, um, session of the uh, PID interest group. Uh, we've got the next uh, hour and a half or so together. Um, we've. I'm going to kick off. Uh, Josh is helping me. Can you put on the next slide, please? My name's Jonathan Clark, by the way. I'm one of the co-chairs. Um, the agenda today, I'm going to do a quick introduction for newcomers. I hope there are newcomers. Um, and an introduction to this meeting, why the, uh, the topic. We've got a series of lightning talks, um, which I'll get to in a second. And then if time at the end, we've got time for a discussion. Um, I'd like to draw your attention, please, to the collaborative notes. I'm going to post the link again in chat. Um, please uh, start the fire that up. And at the very least, uh, put yourself in as a participant. Um, but also, please, if you could take notes during the session, that would be fantastic. If we all do that, it ends up with a wonderfully rich document that if people do miss it or you want to refer back, um, it, it turns out to be very helpful. Um, the second thing I'd like to draw your attention to is something new. I've set up a category on the PID forum uh, just for, for us. Um, I know we have a discussion uh, group on uh, the RDA, um, but that doesn't seem to get a great deal of traction or usage just around plenaries. Perhaps that's my fault, but I thought it, in the interest of being more communicative, let's open as many channels as possible. Um, so there's a link to that, and I'll be posting uh, links um, uh, to that after the event. We're running two sessions at the RDA plenary at this time. This is the first one, the main session, and then we have a repeat one at a friendly time for uh, for the States. That's tomorrow late night for me in Europe, um, at the end of the day in the US. Um, just a quick introduction to the Persistent Identifier Interest Group. Um, we existed, we've been around for quite a while. Our job really is to, or what we set up ourselves up to do, was to exchange information about everything persistent identifier. Um, it was clear when RDA was set up that it's obviously a key part of the infrastructure. Um, but as as things develop and more applications, um, it becomes even more important to share information. And so over the last few years, we've become this forum for people to give quick updates on projects, to connect with others. Um, try and exchange any information that people need to know about persistent identifiers. So we've hosted uh, across, uh, so we've got Marcus Stocker in a little bit later to talk about the uh, persistent identifiers for instruments. That's typical of, of the cross-pollination that we try to, to achieve in the interest group. Um, so that's, if you like something, if, you, if you're interested even vaguely in persistent identifiers, then you're in absolutely the right place. The second, for the last couple of years, last couple of sessions, plenaries, we've been trying to attract um, people who might not normally attend or might not normally present. Um, and that's partly to down to a study, actually, the person who's driving the slides, Josh Brown, who's helping me today. Um, Josh did a study for the Freya project, which showed that um, there's an awful lot of, of talking in the bubble. We tend to, and that's certainly for myself from the DOI Foundation, I talk mostly to people in the DOI Foundation or people who are interested in the DOI. And we're not very good as a community about reaching out to a wider group, being more inclusive. And so I don't really know what the magic bullet is to do that, but we're trying, um, in particularly in this one, the last plenary as well, to include people on the agenda that haven't spoken before or, or topics that we haven't included before. Um, and all ideas, please, on the collaborative notes or in the chat for, for how we can do better uh, on that in the future. So that's really the, the background to the, the PIDs of the World Unite, trying to get um, um, some engagement from around the world. And if you could have the next slide, Josh. So we've got uh, seven lightning talks for you uh, coming up, and hopefully we, we sort of go around the world. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Maggie Hellstrom talking about updating us on the PID Alliance. Um, Ritsuko Nakajima from Japan, um, on view from Japan. Uh, first time speaker in the interest group, Luke Borota. I think he's been lurking in the uh, in the group, but he's he's um, a volunteer to speak today. So very happy to have Luke here. Um, Estelle is from, China, from Taiwan. Um, and she's going to update us on uh, 
Orchid Focus in Asia. Uh, Chris Brown from the UK, some interesting things, uh, developing a national PID policy, which I think is, is very interesting for everyone, hopefully. I mentioned Marcus before, and we're going to finish with Alice um, talking about the, the PID forum. Well, and hand over to Maggie, I hope. And I'm going to mute my video. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? So, Josh, can you... Uh, oops, loading it says. So, I did, forgot to explain. Each lightning talk is about five minutes. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Or the Q and A. Just give, me, just give me two seconds. I'll stop sharing and and, and start again. And see if that fixes it because the slide isn't appearing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that seems <laughs> to be symptomatic for the Juno platform. We were saying we were doing so well. Yeah, while Josh is looking for his slides, uh, let me just introduce myself briefly. So my name is Maggie Hellström. I work for a European research infrastructure called ICOS that is uh, primarily look, uh, using a lot of uh, uh, PIDs and, and uh, things like that for identifying data sets from environmental and earth sciences. But uh, that's just a very narrow uh, disciplinary view. So what I want to talk about uh, now to and present to you is uh, an idea for one uh, platform where we could be much, much more uh, inclusive and, and discuss uh, uh, PID related issues in, in a broader community. So next slide, please, Josh. So the PID Alliance, uh, it has sprung out as a as an idea and a concept that was from discussions that were originating in uh, what was called the Freya project. So the Freya project was a three-year project funded by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 program uh, with an aim to extend uh, the necessary infrastructures that are needed to place persistent identifiers as a real core component for open science and open research. And uh, while this was a European project, of course, uh, the scope wasn't just regional, but uh, uh, really aimed at, at promoting PID use in a global sense, because research uh, should know no boundaries. So, um, as uh, uh, Jonathan already mentioned, uh, George Brown uh, was commissioned by the Fredia project to uh, uh, run a scoping study, which would, um, amongst other things, look at how one could um, maintain, well, first of all, build up a, a proper collaboration platform or a community uh, of uh, what is, well, a, a persistent identifier community that would have a global uh, remit, uh, a global membership, and uh, could uh, focus on, on questions which are really common to all of us. For instance, uh, how, how can we uh, sustain uh, PID services? How can we uh, sustain activities that are, are going on to promote the use of PIDs uh, in research? Uh, and of course, not only uh, at the, you say, publisher or repository or funder level uh, to have discussions there, but also to reach out to uh, larger organizations like research infrastructures and ultimately also to um, researchers. Uh, so, uh, the result of this study is, is a around 50-page report, which is very interesting, and I really recommend all of us, all of you, to, to go follow the link on the slide and, and check it out. Uh, the next slide, please, Josh. So, um, distilling out the recommendations of this report, um, it turned out that uh, of all the people that Josh uh, interviewed and talked to in his scoping study, that there was really uh, a, a strong support for this idea to have a, a common community. Uh, but it, one of the things that came out of it was maybe we should avoid the word federation. So that's why the alliance or the PID alliance concept was born. And uh, concerning the alliance, well, up to now, uh, 
a large majority of the people and organizations that have been involved in discussing PID services, PID issues, etc., or actually that the whole PID community, which uh, then uh, should uh, can be considered to uh, encompass all who are actually really engaged in in uh, PID adoption and governance and uh, also services uh, for providing PIDs, of course. Uh, most of them today are, are in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it's a European, Australian, um, uh, well, I could say North American really um, effort. Of course, there are also actors and, and important players in, in China, India and other countries. But mainly the discussion has been a very Northern Hemisphere focused. So there's really a need to, to embrace diversity not only in the approaches uh, and, and opinions, but also to pick up on and invite uh, people from organizations, from funders, uh, uh, publishers, etc., also in the Southern Hemisphere. And that's really, uh, this inclusivity is really a, a vital thing here, because otherwise it's so easy that, that uh, discussions get uh, very one-sided or very biased. Um, However, it's very important also that uh, such an uh, alliance structure uh, doesn't become very uh, too, too big or too complicated or too top heavy or, or certain uh, communities are not involved. So uh, th there is a great need for both inclusivity but also balance because we want the lightweight uh, thing moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, other findings uh, involved that uh, this could really, um, discussions in such a PID Alliance forum could really bring coherence uh, to interoperability and coordination issues. Um, especially this communication and advocacy has uh, maybe not been the strong point of uh, the existing PID community. So, uh, it's not just about the inclusivity in terms of having members from many different backgrounds and representing different uh, sub-communities, but it's also about how we, do we communicate things here so that it's not just IT people speaking to IT people uh, or um, librarians speaking to librarians, but we, we really need to find a common way to, to discuss and also so that we can identify common topics and, and really be efficient in our advocacy towards uh, say governments, uh, policy makers, etc. And uh, out of this discussion came really three priorities. So, so inclusivity, I mentioned a lot, communication, I also mentioned a lot, and also interoperability to address that, those kinds of issues. Uh, Can you wrap slide. up, Maggie, please? Yes, I was just asking for final slide. Thank you. And here so you can see what next, you can read it yourself, uh, sort of. Uh, uh, there's much more work to be done and we're now going to try to elicit funding so that we can pick up and continue the work that Josh already started with his uh, study and uh, broaden that to, to figure out how to get, go forward. So if you want to join this, just let us know and uh, you're mostly welcome. Thank you. Uh, I should just mention that unfortunately I have to leave now for another session, but Josh is here, so he'll be able to answer questions uh, later on. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks, Maggie. That's great. Um, trying to get the hang of this. I think I interrupted you by pressing on. I've got my video, my uh, audio on. Sorry about that. So next up we have uh, Ritzko on the view from Japan. Are there any questions? If there are any questions, um, Please use the Q and A, but I don't see any right now. So let's let's carry on. Um, and if there are any questions for Maggie, um, Josh or I could answer that because we've been involved. So over to Ritzko. Hi, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, my name is Ritsuko Nakajima. I'm from JSD. That is, uh, stands for Japan Science and Technology Agency. JSD is a national funding agency and also has a mission to collect, compile, and preserve domestic and foreign scientific and technological information and provide and make such information available for public inspection. 
Today, I will talk about how pairs are registered and used in Japan by touching the overview of the scholarly information created in Japan or by Japanese researchers. Uh, next slide, please. In Japan, open science policy has been promoted in accordance with global trends. The policy of science and technology is implemented based on the science and technology basic plan. Uh, open access first appeared in the fourth plan in 2011. Open science appeared in the fifth in 2016. And last month, the sixth the plan was approved in which open science should be promoted in the construction of a new research system and stated to improve the environment for management and promotion of the use of reliable research data. Next slide, please. As for peers, DOI is mainly registered to journal articles. Uh, most Japanese journals are published by learned, so learned societies. Some societies run journals by their own platform using external uh, commercial platforms. And others uh, publish their journals on the international pub commercial publisher sites. And other societies publish, uh, they're not, uh, publish their journals on uh, JSD that's uh, on the... Uh, left bottom on the slide. Uh, it, it is a journal platform uh, provided by JST. A large number of journals, actually more than 3,000 journals with 5 million articles are published on this platform. Uh, for uh, articles on JST, the DOI is registered with JALC, the Japan Link Center that is operated by JST in collaboration with other three scholarly organizations. JALC has registered more than 7 million DOI so far, and its objects are journal articles, books, and research data, and others. The research data counts 164,000, uh, and the uh, members that registered the research data is shown in the bottom right figure. Uh, the most so the number one uh, organization is National Institute of Japanese literature that they have uh, some classic uh, Japanese materials. And others are mostly uh, registered by research institute under the uh, National Institute of Informatics that is one of the, uh, another uh, organization of op uh, operating organization of JALC. JALC is also a member of the CrossRef and data sites so that JALC members are able to choose registration agencies depending on the content. So in this way, the, uh, we have various routes and content types. Next slide, please. Last year, uh, I, I touched the uh, JSTage, the journal platform for uh, learning societies, JSTage, and uh, we launched a new data repository uh, called JSTAGE Data. It allows uh, JSTAGE journals to upload data used in their articles. All data is open access, and the DOI is automatically assigned to each data item and linked to the articles on the JSTAGE each other. The number of data is small yet, but we expect that it would increase in the near future. Next slide, please. For information on researchers, uh, JST ran a researcher directory research map where more than 3, uh, 300,000 researchers are registered. They can input profiles, research outputs, research projects that they are involved in and whatever they need to communicate with uh, researchers and other stakeholders. We consider that most of the active researchers have an account with research map because it used in research workflows, including the grant application process and reporting of research outputs. Next slide, please. The research map is referred to a review of applications for research grants. To apply for a public research grant, the researcher ID is required. 
the research map uh, linked with the largest research grant can he by the researcher ID. Also, ORCID IDs ID can be registered at the research map, and the researcher can feed ORCID data to the research map. Next, please. Uh, here's my uh, summary of my talk. I'm not repeating this, but I would like to emphasize that the, the interoperability among global and domestic IDs in an in, is an important issue. Uh, in Japan, the amount of research output is large and the ecosystem has been built in its own way and it functions properly. While keeping that system, ensuring interoperability and circulation with global system is, uh, is essential. So thank you. That's wonderful. Thanks, Ruth. Thank um, yeah, I think inter interoperability is really important. It was one of the uh, issues that, uh, that came up in the fire report too. I think it's one of those things that that's um, easy to easy word, but it's difficult to actually make happen. And so I think if some of the um, examples of case studies of, of true improbability. And we'll hear a bit about that later, I think, but uh, I think those are really important to share. Yeah, I would like to uh, so to know that other in other countries, so what kind of so efforts are uh, being made here. Thank you. So let's move on. If there are questions, um, then please, please add them to q and A. I'll do another plug for the uh, collaborative notes. Um, thank you very much for putting your names in there and, and the ideas for being more inclusive. But if you want to write some notes in there, that's uh, please feel free. So next up is Luke. Hi, Luke. We've never met. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so five minutes on COBOL metrics, starting now. Sure, thank you. So I'm Luke. I'm one half of a small nonprofit called Funken joining you from Toulouse in the south of France. And we'll talk about the URI transmutation, which is something you might not know you need when you work with bids. Um, so I'll start with a short video. Next slide, please. And if you could play the video. That shows how I feel when I join conferences about fair data in bids. Oh, the audio isn't playing for me, but it's it's not the most important thing. Thanks, I think we can move to the, the next slide. You got the idea. Um, so PIDs are really nice. I love PIDs, we need them. Um, but they are not a silver bullet. They do not solve every issue that we have. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so what we're doing with Cobalt Metrics, uh, we've been described as the new kid on the blog of Altmetrics. We try to make Altmetrics and citation metrics, generally speaking, truly, truly alternative and diverse. So we support 300 different natural languages and 60 plus types of identifiers. Not all of them are persistent, but I think that's important. Uh, there are two different services, the Citation Index and the URI Transmutation API that I'm going to present today. Next slide, please. Um, so just a few words about why we need projects like that. When we look at the Citation Index that we have in Cobalt Metrics, 91% of the citations are not bits. They are URLs, HTTP, HTTP, SFTP, but then compact identifiers, which is not really the same thing as PIDs, but for the purpose of this presentation, it's it's, it's OK. Only account for 9% of the citations. So how do we make the PID graphs and all the nice resources that we have in the Skullcom community interact with the web at large? Um, next slide, please. So that's a, a toy example of what a PID graph could look like. You have people, you have organizations, and then you have things like services, digital objects. Um, they all have very nice, fancy, expansive, quote unquote, PIDs like ORCIDs, grid IDs, uh, DOIs. Um, but it's not always easy to enter the PID graph. You have the PIDs to jump between nodes, but you need extra um, like points to enter the PID graph. So what we add in Cobalt Metrics, next slide, please, is that you can enter any node from a non-persistent identifier. So it's really something that 
comes on top of the PID graph. Uh, and for example, we can interact with uh, the PID graph that's the result of the Freya project and that's hosted by data sites. So you can start with an HTTPS uh, URL and then we give you the DOI that is equivalent and then you can start working the PID graph. You can start with an email address and we'll find the, the ORCID ID for you. Uh, you can also start with the ORCID ID, of course. Um, but we're really trying to add all identifiers so that you have many entry points that match your internal systems, your old databases, because no one is going to go back and add uh, or mint PIDs for old uh, projects. Next slide, please. And the final thing that we add is what we call dangling URL. So if a URL is known to be equivalent to a DOI, even if it's broken now, or if it's a short URL, you can still use it with Cobalt Metrics to access the PID graph. Uh, and what's the point of that, you're going to ask. Next slide, please. And that's the final slide, is that we have released, as of today, and I'm sharing the link in the chat, what we call Citation Digest. And Citation Digest summarize everything we know about a given, let's say, publisher. So we have 500 of them that are uh, free and open. And there are about 60,000 coming, because we're generating one from every uh, Crossref member, so not necessarily a publisher, but roughly that's the idea. And then we summarize all the citations that we have with breakdowns by citation formats. And you see that PIDs are not necessarily the most used format to cite works. Um, you're going to have a breakdown by language, and you're going to see that English is not necessarily the most citing language. Um, and the next step for us is to compute the number of uh, works, like DOIs, that are only cited in languages other than English. Uh, and of course, we're doing that to try to compete with Altmetrics and Altmetric, sorry, .com and uh, Plum, uh, which we think are not doing a good job at being diverse and inclusive. And that's all I have. Can you hear me? Great. Thank you about dangling URLs. I love that. That's <laughs> going to be my new. <laughs> Do we have any questions for Luke? Thank you very much for that, Luke. That was perfect. The timing was good too. Have you been you've been in touch obviously with DataSite and uh, have you been in touch with Jeff Builder or Crossref to because I know they're looking at at uh, those dangling URLs as well. Yeah, we've been in touch with them every now and then. Um, they also have been working on even data, which is real interesting. But even data focuses on DOIs, uh, which is fine, and we need it. But we're trying to do something a bit different with all the, the yeah. languages and the IDs that no one looks into, because uh, we really do think it's important. Otherwise, I mean, that's the difference between like a structural zero and a sampling zero. If you look at that metric and you only publish in French, for example, you're going to get really bad scores even though your works can be cited, and we're trying to address that. So it's a bit different from other approaches to Altmetric. Yeah. Love it. Any questions, put them in the Q&A. Uh, we've got time at the end if uh, you want to think up your questions. But if there, I don't see anything. OK, let's move on. Um, segue to Orchid. Thank you very much, Luke. And Estelle Cheng. Hello, everyone. This is Estelle. So yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, can can Excellent. can you hear me? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, perfect. So I think hello. I'm gonna start the timer. <laughs> okay, great. Now, yeah. So hello, everyone. Thank you for Jonathan inviting me to here be here. And I'm Estelle Chen. I'm now the Orchid Engage Manager for Global Direct Members, and I used to work in the deal coming to here. So kind of. Uh, have been in the pitch world in APEC region for the past six or seven years. And next slide, please. So I'm happy to share just some little feedback. And what uh, do we have today? I'm going to show a bit of ORCID statistics and to share a bit more on what's happening in Asia in terms of pits. And probably some of you know that actually there are five DORIs here in Asia, and I will just go through later on. And also to point out some of the national PIDs initiatives I'm aware of in this region. And also I want to provide some feedback in terms of you know, the policy side and interoperability side in PIDs. Probably echo some of the other speakers. And next slide, please. 
So yeah, and as you know that ORCID is truly global, we do have members and researchers all over the world. So I think it's a good starting point to see how ORCID access by researchers. So speaking from that, uh, our records show that actually the top five visitor countries, two are from Asia, so China and India. And of, of course, the, the rest are distributed across Americas and in Europe. But OK, so from the organizational point of view, so next slide, please. So how about organizations? Do, the, do organizations here in Asia, they use ORCID or adapt ORCID into their research workflow, research infrastructure? The answer is yes, but not as um, high or as widespread as the America or uh, I mean the Americas or in Europe. But uh, as you can see in, from the diagram, so especially about integrations, that means you know systems connect with ORCID. And actually Japan accounts for a little bit. So they're about 2.2%. Um, so as, as I think uh, Mr. Yakanjima just said, so I think um, it's a starting trend to reveal that some parts here are more start to more impress more about persistent identifiers and next slide please so yeah the record insights that i draw that the implications i draw is that that researchers start to use orchid in asia more or less but in terms of you know organizations in asia they just emerge to connect OT into their infrastructure and uh, and then also ORCID doesn't stand alone. And how about other PEDs aside from us? And next slide, please. So I want to point out that uh, I think everybody is quite aware of ORCID. And, uh, but actually in Asia, there are five DOIRAs and actually two in China and one in Japan and uh, one in Korea and actually one in Taiwan that I used to work there. So I think it's also worth uh, to worth thinking about how to bring those you know, already in the DOI community, but across a step ahead to be really truly international, to be more diverse and inclusive. And next slide, please. And also uh, by this chance, I also want to point out that there are, indeed there are some regional or domestic or national peace initiative here. Like in China, I'm aware that at least there are two kind of national um, PITS initiative. Uh, the one, uh, one is called Knowledge ID, and actually they are connected with ISNI. And the other is CSTR, and they just joined ORCID. So I think it's a great, you know, organizations here in this region, they start to realize that PITS cannot stand alone. <laughs> they need to also connect to more internationally. And yeah, in Japan, we got research name Rider, which we just saw, they already connect with ORCID. And in Korea, we got another national ID as well there. And next slide, please. So I think uh, in Asia, my feedback in the past few years, I think everyone, not everyone, most most people here, they they kind of appreciate the, the, the part of identification. So they know, they, they acknowledge the identifier nature of identification, but they are less aware of or persistence is actually made and promised by organizations or policy or infrastructure to keep this persistent life and uh, valid. So I think in my next slide, please, I just want to bring some um, reflections. I think, uh, and also here, I think the emphasis puts people here they put much emphasis on technical interoperability but don't forget actually policy is the driving force for all such together and also people or the 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 feedback i have here is that sometimes they underestimate about the value of beats it's not only about assigning ids to entities it's more about we need to have a clear governance behind any PIT system and you know to ensure metadata quality linking of course persistence and again connect everything reveals the true power of PITs. just so just some reflections and your question and comments are welcome
I think that's my last start. And thank you. We lost Jonathan. Yeah, I think we lost him. <laughs> his connection. I mean, no problem. Um, are there any okay, questions Josh. for? Are there, are there any questions for Estelle from the audience? There is a chance to ask questions at the end as well, of course. Um, so, if there are no questions in the chat, thank you very much, Estelle. Um, I'll move us thank on you. Me. Thanks very much. Cheers, and we'll have. Head to our next speaker. Chris, over to you. Thanks, Josh. Right, I've just set my timer going. I must stop me waffling on. Good morning, afternoon, evening, good middle of the night, whatever it is. Um, yeah, I'm just going to talk about uh, national pig policy in the UK. Um, bit slide, please. And you'll see there's a GIST logo there because I work for GIST, but there's also more brains, um, particularly Josh, who's Josh Brown, who's um, not related, but done a lot of work on this. Um, so uh, credit to Josh. So I'm going to really talk about this in two parts in five minutes, pretty much what we've done so far, not concentrate on that too much because that has been presented at other, other events. And when we talk about this in the national um, PID strategy session boff tomorrow, tomorrow, and then what we're doing at the moment. So basically, the start of the journey was building on the map in the PID landscape, and we had done a lot of work around PIDs within JISC. There was a prof Professor Tickell recommendations, I'm not just read out on the, the screen here, um, which inspired the UK PIDs for Open Access project, which JISC has been running um, most of all of last year and into this year as well. And part of that was setting up the stakeholder task group and, and running a survey. I'm not going to go into the details of the survey today not much time, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the staff stakeholder task group. And that's an example of some of the, the mapping work that we've done previously. Next slide, please, Josh. Right, so uh, on the community consortium stakeholder, because a lot of this work is working with the community. Uh, so it's not just uh, a JISC led, it's a sort of a JISC initiative from the TICAL recommendations, but working with the community. So like it says there, bringing together national agencies, funders, institutions, research managers, publishers, PID providers, business case for multiple PID consortium, particularly to lower the barriers for PID adoption. So there's strong support for the consortium. We need to look at the governance and sustainability models to, look, to allow for that long-term community engagement, prioritize interventions, um, and also provide support to um, so the sort of outreach activities. Next slide, please. And out of that was the five priority PIDs. There was the grants, identifiers from Crossref, uh, the DOIs there, um, projects, RAID, research activity identifier, ORCID for people, research organization registry for organizations, and DOIs from Crossref and data cycle outputs. Next, please. So what we're doing now, I mean, that was a quick run through of what we've done, but where we are now is um, working on workflows and cost benefit analysis in particular. So on the workflow work that's going on at the moment, this is a Miro board that we're gonna be publishing um, easier to consume, put it that way, um, outputs on those uh, priority areas on funding, institutional research management, content publication, articles and data. And there'll be an overview one as well, to sort of link them all together. So we're hoping in June to have the funding and articles one and then the, the, the other ones in August. So it's looking at the you know, real world activities to plug in PIDs, uh, where they, how they fit into that, that those workflows. Um, next slide, please. So some of the highlights of the cost benefit analysis that was also going on because we need to look at actually rather than saying PIDs are good and that's it. We need to actually sort of quantify that, put some value and how integrating PIDs can save, um, not just how that's saving on time and effort equates to money. So it's the three areas that have, where the benefits would accrue, which is metadata reuse, augmentation, aggregation analysis, and we, as in more brains, are currently collecting data and conducting interviews um, around workflow analysis, the data exchange mapping, benefit quantification, modeling, and community impact analysis. Next slide, please. 
So to reach that destination of, of you know, trying to get uh, multiple PID consortium, trying to get those PID integrations, trying to get those workflows, just to sort of understand that pathway, which goes back all the way to mapping the PID landscape. We did what a couple of years ago, is to take the model workflows and work backwards, identify quick wins. And we're doing this uh, also about PID integrations. It's not just doing, say, to the community and PID providers who need to do this. We're doing this within JISC as well on, on our open research services. So um, and something that we're doing at the moment, which is coming up in the first meeting in May, is setting up the Research Identifier National Coordinating Committee. Uh, we still haven't got a bad name for RINC, but maybe we will one day. Maybe it's too late. I don't know. But to focus on governance and community accountability. So that's sort of the governance layer to a meeting in May to, sort of, to um, working with a, a number of organisations um, from the community to establish balance, so get balanced community representation, um, facilitate agenda setting activity design. Next slide, please. I'm just finishing off because I've got five seconds. Um, not loading. Next slide. Oh, yeah. So that's the. Um, I can't hear my time ago. Uh, so just to say, there's a poster. Please have a look at that. Come to, along to the BOF tomorrow. There's a sort of gist booth if you've got want to know any um, further information on this. And the final slide is just thank you listening and uh, credit to, well, it's from me and Josh, I have to say. Thank you. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, yeah, I had to refresh. Sorry, everyone. I was, uh, that's why I have, so I, I forgot to thank Josh uh, at the start. He's, uh, he's my wingman on this. Um, so if I, if I drop out, which I just did, um, he's there to make sure everything continues. So thanks very much for that. Um, do we have questions? Don't see any. I'll be going to a lot more detail on this in the in the BOF, and there's also um, you know our, our just booth which has details on some of the work we've been doing and various links to some of the blog posts. So I realise my head's going from one thing to another. It's having multiple screens <laughs> and a camera in the middle. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Have you had have I you had those... any interest? Have you had any interest from other countries on? It's like I, I think Australia uh, developed a a, a a national PID policy. Have you? Had yeah, the reaction from other countries who are interested in this. I know there's some Australians here, so they might be able to come better than I can. But yes, yeah, so on the BOF we're running tomorrow. That's so uh, there's uh, UK, Netherlands, Finland, Australia, Canada, and also um, Brazil. What's well, Brazil and Peru? So we're trying to. Talk about these different um, strategies that are, that are ongoing. Um, and yes, the US PID policy. Yes, I did have a slide highlighting that, but I had to take that one out. So, um, <laughs> yes, that's influenced some of the work we do as well. So, you know, there are reasons behind why we're doing this work, not just the TCAL recommendations. But, um, yeah, and I know the Netherlands, yes, I mean, there is quite a, a lot of overlap between these national strategies. Hope we can explore those more in the off. And I'm happy to talk about them now. I mean, the, is, is those priority PIDs came out from that community and the, and the, the stakeholder group. Yep. Um, so welcome, to, interested to see what other countries feel, you know, those are the same priority PIDs and how they think about integrating them. Is, is this something that we should think about on the PID Alliance? Because, and sort of involving countries that, um, that do, are developing or have developed a, a national PID strategy, perhaps there should be a way for them, or is that the forum that, you're gathering tomorrow, but maybe suggested tomorrow whether people are interested yeah, no, in a bit of light. Yeah, there's definitely commonalities and, um, you know, we need to work together, not separately. So uh, I think that's definitely important. Um, well, different remits, but they, you know, people involved in the rink and the stakeholder group are also involved with the PID Alliance. So, you know, we're um, not excluding anyone. And it's sort of, we're you know, gathering as much information and you know, the discussion as widely as possible. And although it's a UK uh, strategy and it's a UK group, I mean, working in these PID space for a while, it's, it's clear for many years that you can't look at it in isolation. You have to look at it internationally. So a lot of work we're doing, and, and I should also said so the cost benefit analysis will be showing the results there. I think that'd be very useful for other countries, but just be useful for the UK. So I see that Maria has posted a couple of things about the Netherlands. That's fantastic. Mm. Could I ask you, please, Maria, could you copy paste that? Because I don't, um, 
if I get thrown out again, the chat disappears for me. Could I ask you to put those links into the collaborative notes, please? Um, add them too. That would be really useful. Okay, let's move on. Marcus, are you there? Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Adam. There's Marcus. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I think so. Y yes. Yeah, you're there. Yeah, it's a little bit. It's, it takes a bit of getting used to this platform, but you're there. I'll, yeah. uh, I'll mute, mute myself and you've got five minutes. Update us on uh, the PID instrument group. Okay. Uh, Josh, are you? Hang on. I don't think the slides have. I can see the slides. But not my camera. I'm not sure why that's the. Oh, I'm still seeing Christopher's slide, not yours. I have moved it on to um, Marcus's, so I don't know if anyone else can see Marcus's slide. I, Otherwise, I, can, I, can, I can. I can see the slides. I think Jonathan. Right, Natasha says she. Okay, great. Must be me. Time to refresh again, Jonathan. I think. Good. I'm not sure why my video, so I'm, I'm just turning off my videos. It doesn't seem to work. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm just starting. Uh, hello, everyone. Marcus Stocker here. Um, speaking on behalf of the RDA Working Group Persistent Identification of Instruments, I'm giving you a quick um, round um, and the updates of what happened uh, recently. Uh, Josh, hi. Next slide, please. So um, briefly highlight two outputs, which I think it's worth doing. So we had um, last year uh, a publication um, in the Data Science Journal, which essentially describes a little bit what the working group did, its output during the lifetime of the working group. So the working group has um, reached the end, is now in, in maintenance mode. Um, and this is a good reference here, I think, um, for you know getting back to the work that was done and also the, the schema and how we did it. Um, so this is all described there. Next slide, please. Um, we also have a more living document at this URL, uh, which might be of interest to some, um, just to also keep up with what happened since the publication of the Data Science Journal. So here we also um, update all the, uh, or keep um, updated the, the, the schema. We, we uh, discuss the schema and the work a little bit more detail in technical details. Also, we have um, some step-by-step um, -step instructions how to use the two approaches. And uh, so this is more for developers um, for, for, with, with more details compared to the, and an evolving document also compared to the data science journal. So these are two resources that you might want to look at uh, if you um, are interested in applying persistent identification for, for instruments um, in your research infrastructure, for instance. Uh, next slide, please. So um, key output is, of course, a schema. So we did develop a schema, uh, which is available on, on GitHub and this URL. You can take a look at this. Um, and uh, this is an output of an analysis of, of use cases. Um, we had 15 use cases during the life um, time of the uh, of the working group that we analyzed. And we looked at the common metadata and we crystallize sort of the most common metadata desired by the community here um, for instruments. And this um, is then the output, this schema. So also a resource um, to take a look at. It's evolving, of course. We had some changes also recently. Um, and we are constantly listening and interacting with the community also um, to hear about uh, whether the schema works in their context or whether there are uh, more changes necessary. So this is a, also an evolving um, document, of course. Next slide, please. Um, quickly on the two approaches. So instead of setting up um, yet another infrastructure for identification, what, what this group um, chose to do is to leverage existing infrastructure for identifications. And we tested this with two um, existing systems. So one is data side. This is the data side approach. And you can see here um, a persistent identifier instrument. So remember, these are instances, not models. Um, and um, HCB, I think Rolf is also on the call here, um, has tested this. So there are some instruments um, uh, registered with uh, with data side UIs. And you know this, you have the view on data side and of course the 
corresponding landing page here. Next slide, please. The interesting thing and the data site or PID graph was already mentioned today. Um, you can also look this up uh, over the graph QL um, API that data site provides. And here is the query for this instrument. So I'm giving the DOI of the instrument and I'm extracting some of the information using, of course, the PID um, metadata schema, which PID metadata schema, which we aligned uh, to the data site schema. So there is a little bit of work there going on also a data site to make some changes and add up uh, some the schema by data site uh, with some of the input from this group. Uh, next slide, please. And um, as you can imagine, interesting, uh, of course, is the linking to other identifiers. So you have here the view on the instrument, but of course we include here other identifiers, persistent identifiers. One is, for instance, the organization. Uh, here are Helmut Central Berlin for material and energy, and also, for instance, related identifiers like a journal article describing this instrument. And this would be uh, a journal um, article published at the Journal for Large Scale Research Facilities, I believe it's called. Um, next slide, please. In addition to data site, we have an approach with EPIC. Um, and this was tested by Louis with BODC. And um, again, here it's a handle.net based approach. So you can look up the metadata also at the handle.net server, and you can see that it's a slightly different um, approach. So the advantage with Epic is that it's a full implementation of the PID schema, PID in schema versus uh, data site has an alignment. Uh, so it's not the full implementation of the schema. Here we also have in, in the Epic approach measured variables and, and really um, a, a PID in uh, implementation. Here the landing page is machine readable um, sensor ML description of the, of the document. Um, of the of the metadata of the instrument. So this is just to show that um, different content can be served both for machines and, and, and for humans. Um, next slide, please. So we had um, a little bit of adoption or certainly interest from the community. So there are um, data repositories or data publishers like Pangea that um, have been looking at uh, adopting this um, approaches and, and persistent identification of instruments with the schema developed here. Um, there is a uh, community in Australia, I4IOS, that um, community of practice that has come together on this topic. And we're also um, interactive with them, um, trying to get feedback on what's going on in particular in Australia and here about um, adoption there. Um, and other research infrastructures that have been on board for a while already, of course, HCB Berlin, um, BODC there um, since the beginning there, but the ICOS has, has shown interest. AVI also has submitted a use case originally. Um, so you can see there is a little bit of bias to earth science. So we are continuously trying to encourage us, of course, other communities in other disciplines, including I don't know, social science and to understand also what an instrument is in this uh, um, in these disciplines and, and see uh, if the proposed uh, schema really works. Um, one next slide, please. One um, effort that I would like to briefly highlight is, is by EUDAT and in collaboration with Datasat and EPIC, um, they have um, recently worked on a registry for instruments that implements the persistent identification of instrument schema. Uh, it's called Betweens. Um, you can look it up. You can test it out um, if you like on this URL. Um, and yeah, let us know if you if you do this. Um, join the group and uh, let us know if it works and if it doesn't work um, in your community and your systems. Thank you very much for listening. And um, that was it from my side. Thanks for that, Marcus. Um, I'm not sure if Jonathan is in the room at the moment. I, he's been popping in and out of the chat. But um, are there any questions for Marcus from members of the audience? Uh, if you have any, let's just see what's in the Q&A tab. OK, I think we've got some more general questions there, which might be useful at the end. But anything specifically for Marcus at the moment? 
Okay, thanks, Marcus. Um, that was really Thank you. Um, there will be a chance to discuss more at the end of the session, um, but it's now over to our next speaker, um, Alice, to talk about the PID Forum. Over to you, Alice. You have five minutes. Thanks, Josh. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, my earphones aren't working. Um, uh, the audio isn't working if I have my earphones in, so I know I don't have a very loud voice, so, so flag something, shout in the chat if you can't hear me. Um, so I'm here to talk about the PID Forum. Many thanks to Jonathan for the invita invitation. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about what it is for those of you that don't know. And in particular, I want to talk about um, the fact that uh, we're hoping that the PIDIG will start use making more use of it, particularly as Jonathan mentioned at the beginning in between plenaries. Next slide, please. So I know some of you here um, are all quite familiar with the PID Forum, but I think there's probably some people who are less so. So um, like the, the PID Alliance idea, actually, this came out of the Freya project. Um, so it's been going for about three years now. Uh, when Freya wound down at the end of last year, uh, they were looking for a new home for it and to put all this work into the forum and then have it um, just fizzle out. So they they um, did an RFP and I was very happy coming from a sort of PID background to talk in myself that um, my new organisation, or not so new now, um, NISO, the National Information Standards Organisation, was selected as the new home. Um, so we've done a bit of work uh, since between sort of November and now, talking to various uh, organisations and individuals in the community about what sort of things um, you want from, from the forum. And the three main areas that have been identified are that it should be an open discussion forum for PID questions and challenges, a place for collaboration and coordination in the PID community, and a space for technical PID discussions. And I think all of this is happening a bit, but I think there's a lot of room for more of it to happen and for more people to be included. And I think there's also potentially space for more uh, other things to happen there as well. So, so this is what we're focusing on at the moment, but we would really love your engagement. So as of, I think, last week, we had um, over 660 users. There are 27 categories, which are sort of areas of interest, including the new one for the RDA uh, PID interest group, which hopefully um, you'll all join later. Um, and there are five sort of active groups, which are, which are sort of a mix of private and public groups. There's also what I think is an increasingly helpful knowledge hub of sort of basic PID information and resources, including a fair bit in non-English language um, resources. So if you have questions or if people ask you for sort of basic information you want somewhere to point them to that's a really good place to go next slide please so i wanted to show you a little bit about engagement this is a sort of good news bad news slide i think that the good news is that you can see that overall i think engagement has been increasing over the past um three months or so which is great uh the not so good news is that the numbers are very small so um you know it's been great we've had 27 new contributors over the over the last um three months which i'm really happy about but it would be great if it was you know 100 new contributors so um if engagement uh levels are good but the numbers are um we, we'd love to see sort of wider engagement and particularly from a more diverse and inclusive group of organizations and individuals next slide please so who's involved at the moment well this is not um, a complete list obviously but we had our first community meeting last week and this is all the organizations that showed up for that which was fantastic um, pretty global you know more, more so particularly given the timing of it than it might have been um, and it was really good to see such a wide range of organisations represented, including several of the, you know, leading uh, uh, PID providing organisations and a lot of organisations that are uh, using, implementing, advocating for persistent identifiers. Um, among the groups there were the RDA, um, PID interest group represented by Jonathan. Um, and uh, just before that meeting, uh, Jonathan and I had spoken and he had agreed that this would be a good forum, would be a good place to try to, as I say, keep uh, conversations going in between the plenaries, which I think on, to date has not really been the case so much. That you have the plenaries, there's lots of activities, lots of discussion, and then things sort of quieten down until before the next one, and then it ramps back up again. So what we're hoping, what he's hoping, and what we on the forum would love to see is that this is a place where you can continue to communicate, share notes, share thoughts in between plenaries and really keep the momentum going in between. So this is what the page looks like. It's pretty basic. Um, this is a, this is the uh, PID interest group category. It's open to anyone. You don't have to be a PID 
member, you know, anybody, you'd have to be actually actively involved in RDA to look at this. And I think, I, I'm not sure whether Jonathan's back on the line yet, so I'm sure if you are Jonathan, you'll jump in. But I think what uh, the idea is that it would be a place for people who aren't necessarily involved at the moment in, the, in your community to get more involved. Next slide, please. So what can you do? These are my sort of asks for you or our asks for you. We'd really love you to join the PID Forum community if you're not already there. Uh, you can sign up quickly and easily um, at pidforum.org. Um, you can keep track of the PID IG category. You can see in the top right hand corner there um, how you can do that. There's various different ways of doing it. Um, and keep the conversation going, as I say, between plenaries, share news and updates, invite feedback on your notes that you've taken, that kind of thing. It would be great if you could also invite others to join and participate, both in the RDA PIDIG, also in the forum more generally. And we'd also love you to share your own general uh, PID news um, in, in the forum, uh, you know, use it as a, a sort of media outlet almost, if you like. It's a great place to sort of post stuff and get people to comment and, and feedback. If you think there's a need for another PID forum group, for example, by language, we've got a couple already in Spanish and German. Um, we've got some by persistent identifier. We've got some by community. Um, if you see a need in your community for another group, um, we can easily get that set up. We're actually working on some processes at the moment that we'll share on the forum. But for now, you can just you know post a message or contact me directly, whatever, um, and we can get that set up for you. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, that would be great. So I've been tweeting from that account this morning a little bit, so please feel free to, to go and take a look at that and, and follow us. We do have this group that we're calling PID Forum Champions and Experts, which is uh, many of the people that attended that first community meeting will be meeting quarterly um, from now on. Those meetings are open to everybody. And if you want to be a, a champion or an expert, so sort of go a little bit above and beyond in terms of volunteering to be active on the community, that would be wonderful. But if you just want to come and lurk or post occasionally, that's also great. We would love to have your involvement in any way. That's it, Josh, maybe one more slide. So just a reminder, this is where you can find us and we very much hope to see you there. And I'm happy to answer any questions um, either here or join the forum and I or somebody more expert than me can answer them there. Thank you. Lovely, thanks Alice. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh good, I'm back on again. I struggled a bit <laughs> with this platform. Okay, thank you very much Alice. So um, we have about just a little less than 30 minutes left. Um, let's see if we have any questions. I'll open it up. Um, I think anyone can unmute um, and join us, um, but you can also, uh, um, oh, there are some cute, hey, I've got some questions. Newcomer question, what is the difference between the PID Forum and the PID Alliance? Um, actually, does Alice want to come back on and answer that or shall I answer it? brief answer I'm, I'm obviously more involved in the forum than the alliance and uh, but we have uh, josh who can answer the alliance bit of it and you um but the pid forum is um i mean as i said they were both part of the freya project but the pid forum that i guess the pid alliance could potentially kind of you know use the pid forum as, as a vehicle for communication or as a place to kind of live if it takes off but the forum's kind of already established in a thing and it's open to everybody and um it's a, a sort of communication forum whereas the alliance i think is a would be a somewhat more formal grouping of organizations that want to come together and um work around i think you know the, the communication the interoperability the inclusivity in a slightly more formal way but that's my understanding anyway Yes, and I think the other difference is the PID Forum exists and you can use it today. And the PID Alliance is, is an idea or a thought, something that came out of the project that, that might uh, hopefully become something. So there's another difference. Um, Case just joined us on stage, but did he have a question? Sorry, I'm getting used to this Juno panel. Jonathan, I just want to say we end in 25 minutes. I thought like I said there was yes. 13 minutes left. So. Yep, I've got it. Case. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, again, loud and clear. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, um, I posted a question about um, content-based content identifiers because um, 
I guess one of the uh, the problems with um, PIDs is also scalability and the scalability of the approach. And as we have increasingly more smaller digital objects, even to the point of uh, you know data points, it's not feasible to put everything in a registry. And so I was just wondering if there is, um, especially from the uh, maybe the funding agencies and, and the, the, the libraries in the community, uh, if there's any adoption of content-based identifiers, which is essentially you create a, a hash of the content and you use that. Yeah, I don't know if there's anyone who'd, who'd like to answer. The only one I know of is the software, the people down in Sofia or Antipolis near uh, Nice um, who are who've done that with software um the name escapes me but someone will chat it i'm sure it's a software heritage exactly yeah i linked that also like uh, that. in the in the chat and in the document yeah that's one that's one example um ipld is a pretty big one too but that is more from the web3 and blockchain community uh so it, it's not so visible in science yeah. at the point at this moment I I know there's an initiative uh, from Germany to create a standard called the International Standard Contents Code, which is an intrinsic identifier. Um, that's work in progress, um, uh, but there, there is some work there that I know, and, and that's something actually that DOI Foundation is interested in because the, it, these things could, could interoperate rather well. Yeah, I don't see all because I had the historical chat could you um post a link to that uh, german initiative that you mentioned yeah it's called yes i will i i can yeah if you say it i can also look it up and post it but yeah iscc international standard content code it's a proposal to create an international standard for well, for an intrinsic identifier for content, exactly what you're talking about. Okay. I think it's being developed by the DIN, which is the German standards organization. I think but I can certainly, post a, I can certainly post a link later. I, I can't, there's a limit to my multitasking abilities right now. I Sorry. understand. Thanks. Jonathan, there's another um, question in the Q&A column um, about uh, outputs being so being equated with DOIs almost exclusively. It's phrased as a comment, um, but I think there are, there's a res in the response there, there's an interesting topic, which is, you know, this idea of focusing on uh, DOIs. Um, does that exclude, all, you know, groups like in the life sciences where there's a lot of URI use, and far less DOI focus? Um, and, um, you know, the, there's, uh, Luke observes that um, DOI-centric approaches may be a threat to bibliodiversity. I just wondered if any you or any of the speakers wanted to comment on that. Anyone want to comment? I mean, one thing I'll say that maybe um, I'm kind of jumping in ahead of Chris here, but one of the things we chose to focus on in the UK PID project on DOIs for content based on usage patterns and based on our governance criteria as well. So one of the things we had was that we wanted to be using open identifiers with open organizations um, and kind of clear, transparent governance. And the DOI registration agencies um, were the best candidates who fulfilled that role at the time. So that was a major factor in our deciding to concentrate on DOIs. Uh, Chris, if you want to add. Sorry, as we were delayed, my microphone coming on. Sorry about that. Um, I was going to say one important point probably is to say that a lot of these are time. I, mean, I worked on organisation identifiers before, um, and that was before RAWs even existed. So, you know, things do change. These are a sort of point in time. A lot of these identifiers, so we say priority PIDs, that's the ones that identified as being the priority at this moment. I suppose that implies this <laughs> doesn't always mean it will be the same, but um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm trying to look at the QA as well because, um, yeah, I know people 
have there's been quite a lot of conversation about URI use, um, which can get quite technical. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on, on anything about the DOI's URI debate. There's also a comment on um, NFT, which I have to be honest, I had to look up non-fungible tokens. Goes a bit beyond me. But I think it's blockchain technology. Um, we have occasional discussions around blockchain. We haven't had anyone actually come to the interest group talking about blockchain identifiers. That might be something for the future. Can't see who. Adam, it's red on black. It's terrible for colorblind um, people. Adam. Yeah, I, it, it just because I'm in, and I don't know enough about it that I thought it, this might be the place um, if somebody else knew something about it. Because it's very much um, something that's in the news at the minute, right? That people are saying, uh, I've bought the NFT for this thing because it's the thing that uniquely identifies it and everyone else can have it. Um, but I have the unique identifier for it. So I just thought it might be an interesting thing for this group to consider um, because people are starting to use them as the thing that uniquely and persistently identifies the thing and that has value. Um, so I think it's something that we might see in the future as blockchain and stuff starts to be more embedded in things. Yeah, you had me racing to Google to, to look it up. So that thank you. I'll take we'll take a look at that. Yeah, I think okay. the NFT the NFT by itself is will reside on a blockchain typically, right? So let's say you have an Ethereum NFT. Um I happen to have some because I, I'm into a block blockchain based gaming, but um uh, I think the proper way to address those with a persistent identifier would be using something like IPLB, which can also include uh, Ethereum identifiers. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions? I was going to pick up on Christopher. Oh, no. I was going to pick up on some of the comments because uh, I asked you to comment on uh, what's one thing we could do to, to be more inclusive. Um, and I think I liked the, um, we, we did that a few years ago with folk trying to get some stories from users, some working examples. I think that's a good point. I, it's worth maybe for the next uh, plenary. Um, I think there was a, a, a one of the, I think it was a Pitapalooza. There was a presentation from a, a scientist about how he was using uh, interoperable, I think he was connecting uh, ORCID, populating his ORCID account with, uh, with all sorts of, with his work. And that was a really nice example. So that's something for us to, to work on as co-chairs, see if we can get some, um, some user stories. A time zone someone mentioned, I think that's a really good point. Um, we're trialing at this time, running two versions of this session, um, and we'll see uh, uh, whether we get good engagement there. Um, and a couple of people mentioned cross RDA. Um, yes, absolutely. It, as someone else said, I think it, it's sometimes a struggle, especially when it's all virtual. Um, somehow it was easier when you met people in the corridor. So let's hope we get back to face to face soon. Um, I noted the NFT. I'll look into that and see if we could get some, get a, get at least a, a primer on that for for people to discuss. Is there anything else? Other ideas uh, from people? Feel free to unmute and, and join. Ideas on how we can be um, more inclusive. Get in, other topics in past the usual suspects. Um, feel free, please. I think there are eighty or ninety of us on the call, so um, we've still got fifteen minutes left. So. Please, questions. Comments? Sorry, Jonathan, I was just going to say, I was just going to say about encouraging people to um, switch on their videos and mics and not be afraid to join the discussion. Um, 
particularly around the URI side of things. I mean, I, I don't want to sort of, I don't know, maybe I'm being a speaker, ask a question of you. <laughs> if no one else is going to ask anything, I will. Because um, this is related to the, the interest group, the PID, PID, isn't it? Um, and tomorrow's prof, we're looking at national PID strategies. I mean, discussions such as, you know, URIs um, versus DOIs, if I don't know that's a, a, a battle or thing. But um, is that something that should go on in this sort of interest group? I mean, it's important. I mean, there's quite a lot of other RDA groups where PIDs might be relevant or are relevant. And I just wondered how can we sort of, um, if running this BOF, you know, is there a need for another interest group that sort of looks at strategies, policies level? Um, or is that just going to cloud the issue? That was really my question about, um, you know, mm. there's a need for that group, which is obviously going to be involved in that discussion. So don't, if anyone's got any other questions, they don't, we don't have to discuss that now. Um, I just wonder what Hello. your thoughts were. Hello, can I jump in? Um, yes, um, my name is Peter Pennyfather. I'm from uh, Toronto, and um, I'm an occasional visitor to RDA, but I'm very, um, uh, we ha I have a poster in the uh, post, uh, uh, in the uh, poster session around uh, small data, uh, around circumstantial data, you know, that um, persistent identifiers are good for for instruments that are around for a long time or institutions that are wrong for a long time. But um, in um, social technical um, events, um, there's a there's a person, there's a place, there's a thing, and they're interacting in a, in a particular situation. Um, and this is where we believe that um, uh, content-based identifiers can be generated. Um, there's a huge space of um, uh, of, of creating data objects that can be uniquely identified as having been created at that point in time, um, uh, and um, with with a uh, um, there, there's like a like a, a fair data object will have a um, a central core of value a given. Uh, it will have a, a recording record. It will have a um, policies around the use of that recording record and the, that uh, that value and um, uh, 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 an identifier, a location for where that value exists. And um, I, I'm just wondering if, if moving forward, um, uh, when, how can we create um, uh, ORCID IDs for every person in the world? I mean, this is, a, at some point in time, there'll be a lot of people involved in, in research beyond the institutions. and. Um, and the persistence is that you can find it again. I'm just launching that out, and um, you can go see my very complicated poster uh, um, in the poster <laughs> session. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I, so one of the things I always remember is, is, is I think there are two types of inter infrastructure that you need for uh, persistent identify or persistence. The one is the technical infrastructure, um, and the other is the social infrastructure. Because somehow right. people have to get together to agree that even if the originator of the information has long since dis disappeared, um, something is done to to work on the persistence. And there are many layers of persistence. Um, and so I think that that. that particularly these intrinsic identifiers or the content identifiers are really interesting, but I don't yet see, except with one ex exception on the software ones, a social infrastructure wrapped around it um, that, would, that would, so the location is sitting there, but who, who is going to update the location when it changes? Um, that doesn't happen automatically and there needs to be some form. And that's also a little bit why I worry about the blockchain. Um, yeah for the same reason is that in the end who cares enough to make sure that it's updated and the idea that someone will care i love it i just don't believe it well the trouble with blockchain is that it, it takes a small city about the same power to power a small city or a country to to actually um uh process that that blockchain because it's all manipulated um whereas a, a distributed system could involve um uh individual uh, people maintaining their own cache of, um, of data. They're the authors of the data. 
and um, there will be various people who interact with them, and they will have multiple organizations that they organize, uh, they associate with. It's a it's a question of not, of of just creating when something has happened, when something has been recorded, uh, that that needs to be registered uh, that, that it happened, and. Um, in a way that it can be interpreted regardless of, of any schema. Hmm. So it's a different approach. Uh, yeah. and it's a, but it's, we have a fully operational system that allows you to uh, create data objects that will be, will be persistent based on, on the fact that it was recorded at a particular time and place. So you don't need any um, any standards in some sense it's 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 human readable and then uh, you can make a machine read the human readable uh, stuff that sounds interesting let's see i hope you get a lot of, of interest on your poster cases back up yeah i just wanted to say that the time stamping um you could more or less see that as a definition of blockchain if you read the original uh, paper from um, satoshi nakamoto he actually doesn't call it a blockchain. He calls it a time chain. Right. And so this is the very definition of blockchains, I would say. And of course, the, there are many different ones today and many different technical proposals. Um, so let's say Cardano, Ethereum, etc. And I think that the energy problem is um, solvable and will be solved. Uh, for instance, Ethereum uh, moving to, towards proof of stake. So. Um, not too worried about that, but you're right that um, the time stamping aspect is, is absolutely crucial. And so I have seen some, I, I, I will link in the chat the discussion on the pit forum that I started on this topic, uh, because I do think there is a lot of promise uh, in this idea for science and also for scientific organizations, uh, because um, right now we still have to let's say, agree on um, the organizations that are the source of records, uh, agree on the uh, the trust network. And uh, with a decentralized approach, we can, uh, we can do that much more organically. Uh, so, you know, research communities um, can essentially start to mint their own identifiers. And uh, also the, um, the storage problem, which is real, for instance, in genomics, but but also in uh, uh, in astrophysics, for instance, and th that's another. Uh, I think that's the whole point of Web three, is to move from the current infrastructure where, you know, you have, for instance, Netflix movies, which are stored on the central server, and we all, from our own tiny internet connection, go and download the same thing. Um, a lot of the um, decentralized protocol are peer to peer. So if I download a Netflix movie that someone else also wants to watch, they can also download the content from me. And uh, so I think uh, uh, medium to long term, this probably is where a lot of the scientific um, data storage and also hence in the end identifying minting will move. Um, but right now it's it's a very techy space. It's super user unfriendly. You basically have to be a <laughs> software programmer in order to to work with it. So it's going to take a few years for to get broad adoption. Well, there's no, been sorry. a lot of this. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, there's Peter. Been, there's been a lot of discussion about data as infrastructure, and right now, as countries are building back, um, they might consider the data of their population as as a. Um, as a as a form of infrastructure in in Europe, we had the the the, the mention uh, yesterday about uh, a million researchers and three hundred thousand um, um, institutions, but there are are a hundred million uh, people or, or, or more, several hundred million people in Europe, uh, all interacting with all kinds of institutions, generating data about themselves uh, uh, in various ways, and. Um, somehow engaging people and recognizing their data as as a, as a resource that they can exploit but um, uh, that can also be uh, shared within the community and and data is collected very precisely by instruments all over the world that are that are are, um, are regulated by all kinds of quality standards and um, 
so the, the precision of the data is there. It's just the discoverability and the interpretability that is uh, com uh, com complicated. And um, but it's not complex. It's just complicated. And, and we start. We just have to start uh, realizing this. 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 Um, data. This. Uh, data. Um, 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 discharge as not a pollution, but as, as something that can be um, captured and, and utilized uh, by uh, people other than data brokers. Okay, thanks. I'm going to uh, wrap up the session now. Just a plug tomorrow for um, um, there's this breakout number eight. Uh, data Fabric is talking about digital objects, and you mentioned that, Peter. And I think that that yeah. really it, it it isn't so much about the identifier and what sort of identifier, it's what you can do with it that's going to be important right. in my opinion. So I, whether it's URI, whether it's intrinsic, extrinsic, it's on the, but it's the services that I can build on top of them that I think will be really interesting. So it's mm -hmm. the automatic updating of my ORCID profile is a really good example. It seems trivial, seems like a simple thing, but every day it saves researchers an awful lot of time mm -hmm. um, and, and it drives ORCID adoption. And so I think services like that for data, um, it will. That's really where I like, where I see it moving, rather than decisions on which identifier. Uh, that that's a different discussion. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, we've got about four minutes to go. Um, last comments. I big thank you to Josh and to Christopher for helping me out. Um, please. Uh, don't be strangers. Join the PID forum and and um, uh, and ask questions there. You can also obviously ask questions on the RDA, RDA one. No one seems to do that, but it's there and we do watch. Um, email me directly um, and be in touch. Thank you for the collaborative notes. Um, I'll make notes of this and the other one and combine them. You have the slides. Um, and we have the emails of everyone. So once again, thank you very much for joining. Uh, if anyone has a final comment, then there's three minutes. Otherwise, I'm gonna say goodbye and thank you. <laughs>